So these four days with capturing all of this wildlife was quite um, special for me because I've never experienced it before. And it just shows me in how one discipline can help the other um, basically benefit for a greater goal. So we had a very successful week here at Etosha Heights Private Reserve where we joined Dr. Morgan and, his, and the vets from the University of Namibia. So they managed to collar all the animals that they wanted for the study and it was such a fantastic experience to see so many disciplines come together for the greater good. Whether it's the vets from the University of Namibia, the researchers from NAST, whether it's uh, the students from Germany and it was great to see all of us sort of come together and really join forces and try and really get this project running. We've had a pretty intense wildlife capture event over the last few days. Um, I'm extremely happy with the outcome of it and when we're running off in all these different directions it's uh, it's quite important just to again bring it back to um, the picture, you know, where does colouring a eland in the far west of the park fit into the entire project of looking at these animal movements across different landscapes? Um, we're dealing here with a project that's really quite ambitious in looking at multiple aspects, multiple scientific disciplines coming together to try to monitor an entire ecological systems and what drives the movements of wildlife, particularly the herbivores, the primary consumers, on a savanna landscape like we have here in Natasha, in the Natasha area, should I say. All right, on my left-hand side is uh, the fence between Natasha National Park and a private reserve, which is Natasha Heights Private Reserve. And this is also ties into the study that is being done by Dr. Morgan that basically that between what is the migration of the wildlife from the national park into the private reserve and vice versa and why are the animals um, having these migration patterns so this has been done by elephants uh, which is again one of the problems that we do have uh, which is damage from the elephants but all of this ties into the study on exactly either with the damage why are the animals which is the herbivores and the browsers and graze are still going onto the other side or coming from the other side into the side. This whole multiple land use type uh, is important in terms of our hypothesis that how you manage the land and also the type of land unit that you have. So a national park of two and a half million hectares compared to a private nature reserve, four, five, or six farms together, compared to a very small unit. So we call it um, kudu and giraffe in a very small 1,000 hectare farm as well. So if you compare all this, how do wildlife survive in these different places? And not just how do they survive, how do they affect the entire ecosystem. So where they're going, what is causing them to be there? Is it because of the grazing that's there, good quality grazing? And is that because of the good soils? Is that because the soils that they're on retain enough moisture? So all the empirical data that we have, we're trying to put together into a model to look at this savanna dynamics. Now you can never do everything together, but um, having different aspects with the proper data into it is just something that's really important, I think, not just for Namibia, but I think globally, to sort of rediscover the dynamics in savannas on a scientific basis. They didn't actually just find their way there, meander and graze. They knew exactly where they was going. If I highlight one individual, it might take a while to come up. So I'm just clicking on that individual. You, could, you can see that there was intent to move. 
There was knowledge of the fence being porous. Here we go. In the blue, you can see the movements of that, that individual animal. But remember, like, like yesterday, we collared a springbok in quite a large herd. So this, is, this particular herd is about 60 um, animals. So that represents a herd of 60 animals moving. And what's interesting is when they came back. So when they went, OK, there was a little bit of grazing here. But the narrow lines tell you they knew exactly where they were going. And that is about 80 kilometers that they've moved. And that means a decision. So they were very happy around here for about six months. And then a decision was made, we need to cross the fence. They found an air, a hole in the fence that the elephants probably caused. And they moved where they lambed. Then they came back. Because remember, we have to download the data from these animals remotely, which means we've got to be within about a kilometer of um, the, the springbok to download it. So in May, when I downloaded the data there, they were back. And they're still here. And you can see when they came back. This is also really, really interesting. There. They knew exactly we have to get back. They came down here. And at the time, there were, was a crew that was fixing the Tosha fence. So the fence was fixed. They couldn't get in. So they grazed around here for a while until the elephants came and broke down the fence again. So, ah, we can come in. And now they're back where they were. So there's a very, very big reliance of the animals on that. And what's really cool about it is you have ancient ecological processes, the pan, dominant wind direction, taking all these nutrients out of the pan here, having nutritious grazing on top of that because it, the soils are more nutritious, and the animals using that as the decision-making process. And the more compatible land use you can have within these ecosystems, like the Tosha Heights, um, tourism only, tourism and conservation, no hunting, same as the National Park. This should be allowed, this sort of movement, um, because of the compatible land uses. So that's why this landscape conservation idea um, is so important. Also, we have the communal conservancies to the west, Air of Apuko up here, here uh, Golikoas in this area. And this is one of the few areas where we can look at um, the movement of wildlife between communal and commercial areas. We generally look at either in communal areas or commercial. So when the Ministry of Environment collared these animals, they it created a very nice opportunity through the project to look at what would happen and what are the decisions that they're making between a communal and commercial interface. You see, with with university, it, it, it's very. Sometimes I, I tend to feel it's very theoretical, and there is no that practical element to it, or either the practical element would be very short. So that has always been the gap that needed bridging, and it it helps to have the, the, like with the vet students that were here for the four days that constant exposure and experience on what they're going to be dealing with. Um, it helps not only with uh, building confidence, but understanding the discipline that they chose and getting the love for the industry that they're about to head in. And that doesn't only go for veterinary science, but it goes for any other um, program that is offered by the university, especially the to focus on tourism, understanding how tourism is a bigger it's a bigger picture. It's not just looking at animals and um, looking at uh, the lodging part in you know, the hotels and booking accommodations. I think one of the important things of, of Namibian tourism and for some of the problem causing animals is that we try to create benefit to the communities that actually have the problems also to keep these animals in the large free ranging environment. I mean, one of the species is, is wild dogs. They are extremely difficult to find. They are extremely time consuming to find. So for the, the average tourist, it is a problem to spend so much time to try and see them. Um, some of these animals end up in captivity and they're easier to see or they collared and tourists are taken there because they collared. But the people that live with the cost of preserving these species often do not get the benefit from the tourism. And I think that is a link that still needs to be established. Um, there are talks of something like ecosystem service payments to people that live with these problem animals, even though they don't benefit from, from the tourism itself. 
or some form of um, exclusive tourism. But unfortunately, the, the major part of the tourists do not really visit. For example, if we talk wild dogs, the, the Omaheke region deep in that bush where, where the wild dog lives and causes problem to um, the communities. Um, the same with some of the lions, the hyenas. Um, so, and I, I have no answers, I don't know how to do it, but somehow the benefit of, of preserving these species must filter through the, the people that really have the cost of living with these animals. Um, so I'm very much in favor of trying to conserve animals in areas where they live freely. Um, but yeah, often the, the tourism potential in these areas is really low and complicated to tap into. And that needs a lot of thought and innovation processes both from government, from the conservancies and the, and the tourism sector. I think it's a very important um, step forward if we want to preserve these pristine, large ecosystems where the animals live at, at fairly low densities and, and undisturbed. So we started seeing um, cases of poisoning of vultures um, deliberately in um, where I worked at that point was Caprivi 2012. We had incidences where poachers poisoned carcasses to kill the, um, the vultures because that's how a lot of the park staff pick up on, on poached animals. And, and one incidence, for example, we estimate that more than 400 um, white-backed vultures and some of the other vultures uh, got poisoned. And that um, actually led me to the plan of actually tagging quite a number of vultures and then um, picking up on cases of poisoning of vultures. Um, when then our first challenge actually was that the technology available isn't really good enough to pick up on poisoning cases fast enough. So over the last couple of years, we've been testing and trying and developing different types of loggers, uh, GPS loggers that you can track vultures with, trying um, communication systems. The problem is often that when they get poisoned, they're somewhere on the ground um, without cell phone reception, so you need satellite reception, but satellite modules were quite big back then. They've gone down quite a bit in size now, so we can now uh, have little GPS iridium transmitted um, trackers with less than 50 grams. So that's been quite good advances in technology that we have um, worked with and developed. The other thing is um, wildlife crime in some areas has gone down a bit, so that's favorable to the vultures. In other areas, unfortunately, it's gone up. I think human-wildlife conflict is another potential for poisoning. Vultures are not always poisoned um, directly targeting the vultures. Sometimes it is um, targeting other predators, often lions. They go out, they cause problems. Some of the farmers poison carcasses trying to kill the vultures, uh, sorry, the lions. Um, or trying to poison hyenas or trying to poison jackal and the vultures are just poor uh, bystanders who are trying to do the ecological role and get poisoned. The vultures unfortunately don't have this charismatic um, place in our social media and in our minds as lions or leopards or rhinos or elephants. Um, they are unfortunately not one of the pretty animals, um, but they fulfill very important ecosystem functions. They remove dead animals that might cause disease spread. So they're extremely important and um, they are definitely very uh, important species to preserve for, for the future and for the ecosystem health. In Namibia, we have lost quite a few vultures. Um, exact numbers are difficult to get. A lot of these poison cases do go undetected. That's why we want to um, tag much more vultures to see what's really happening out there. This area of Namibia, the most common one and occurring in big flocks are the white-backed vultures. They do travel extremely long distances, so the problem with these cases is that if you have a few hundred dead vultures, they can be from Botswana, from South Africa, from Angola, from Zambia, Zimbabwe, so they get drawn in from very, very far regions. We picked up tags of dead vultures that came from South Africa, so um, we do know that they travel extremely wide. Also with these GPS loggers, some of the vultures we tagged in the Kunene region, they moved all the way to South Africa, Botswana. Um, so it's a, it's a shared population, and when people see these large numbers of vultures 
at a carcass, at a kill, they always think, oh, there's plenty of vultures around. So it often creates the wrong impression because these vultures do come from extremely far um, areas. There's also effort from MET to monitor the breeding success in Itosha Park. That is a definite stronghold to the vulture population in this region. Um, they do breed in the park and in some years quite successfully. Um, so we have some of our vultures tags moving in and out for breeding into Itosha. If you look at the, the GDP contributors of, of Namibia, tourism was the third and slowly looking at it overtaking the second because um, tourism is, is the fastest growing industry and it's, 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 it's the link between conservation and, 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 and getting the information out there. So in terms of we as tourism enterprises, we provide financial support and exposure for, 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 for such programs. You know, in Namibia there's a lot of uh, programs or projects that are happening, but no one ever brings light to them. And because of, of tourism and us taking out guests, whether it's to, to, to accommodations that um, have a bigger picture and that are doing more than just lodging, it creates exposure for the project and it creates um, financial support. And I think that's what tourism brings in um, to the big picture. And definitely with this pandemic that we have faced right now, not only are we as tourism hit, but everyone that's linked to tourism is also hit. And all the support that we then used to give to tourism is basically gone or that we used to give to conservation projects is gone.